it's this whole thing of leadership and and the delicate balance of there are decisions that need to be made, and yet the leader is a servant. So how does that all mm -hmm. how does that all work? And and how do you step out and and say this is where we're headed, this is what we're going to do, and at the same time be a servant to the group. Merle Burkholder, welcome back to the Anabaptist Perspectives podcast. It's uh, it's really good to have you on again. We've done a number of episodes with you over the years. And this is a topic, we, I, to my knowledge, we've never touched on on this podcast, or at least not directly. And that's the topic of leadership, which is a, obviously a very large topic and we won't cover um, nearly everything we could, but there are some high points uh, to hit that you developed over over the years. You've served in ministry for many, many years, often in leadership positions. You've been in church leadership. Um, you are one of the mentors, I guess you call it, or instructors at the Servant Institute with Faith Builders. Been doing that since it started six years, uh, six, seven years ago. So yeah, I feel like this is formed not just out of, you sat in a classroom and learned this, you know, you've, you've had quite a bit of experience with these things. And I'm really looking forward to what you have to share on this episode, on this really important topic uh, on leadership. So with that introduction, I say we just uh, jump in. Where would you like to start uh, on this? This is a big topic. So where would you like to begin? It is. And leadership is basically influence. So it's um, influencing people to do uh, what's right and to mm -hmm. work together to accomplish important things. And a group of people can accomplish things that people individually couldn't do. Mm. And so then when you have a group of people, you need you need leadership. And someone serves the group by being the leader. And it's not like sometimes we think of leadership as, well, we all have to do what they say and mm. they just get to do what they want to do and the rest of us have to follow. And that's not it at all. The leader actually puts more energy in than anybody else and is serving the group and then sometimes leaders say, well, I wish I would be out there actually doing the the work or the activities, but there's so much work in organizational things and stuff that, that I'm not able to do some of the things that I see people doing that I'd love to be involved in. But by that leader being willing to serve the group by doing the organizational things and, and uh, taking care of all the things that need to be taken care of for a group to function effectively – they make a lot more happen than mm. if they were just kind of out by themselves uh, mm. doing the thing that they have a passion for. And so leadership is really an act of service and it takes a servant's heart to really be an effective leader. And leadership effectiveness is based on two things. It's based on character and it's based on competence. And so people will follow somebody. They'll, mm. They will engage with somebody that they know has integrity, that they know they can trust, and somebody that has a track record of competence that when they're organizing something, it, it happens. Mm -hmm. They can actually complete it and get it done. There are visionary people that don't have the ability to actually carry something out. They have lots of great ideas, but not the ability to actually make it work. And mm -hmm. so, and then there are people that have the ability to do things, but their character, they have character flaws mm -hmm. that detract from their effectiveness. So it's that combination of character and competence that creates trust, which then gives you influence, gives a leader influence with the people. But that doesn't come quickly. It doesn't come by accident. It's part of just stages of of development, and I'd like to just talk about some of those stages mm -hmm. of a leader developing through um, the stages of life to mature leadership uh, mm -hmm. development. And the first one is sovereign foundations, and they're the things that God chooses for us that we don't choose ourselves. Like God chooses the the er era into which we're born. He chose the century, the decade of our birth. He chose the family we're born into. He chose the spiritual environment, the religious environment we're born into. He chose our ethnicity. He he gave us, he, he forms our personality and gives us some natural inclinations and, and skills that are interests, at least, that, that we develop. And so God 
puts those things together and brings us onto the stage of history at just the moment when he that he's prepared us for and we don't choose those things we're there we didn't have anything to do with it um but they're part of our identity and part of of who we are and you think about somebody like moses you know he was born into a hebrew family um but probably at the one of the worst times to be born a hebrew man a hebrew male child mm -hmm. And when all the babies, male babies, were supposed to be killed, and so if you would have been a neighbor to Amram and Jochebed, and you would have come home from your brick making mm -hmm. job, and uh, your spouse would have told you that Amram and Jochebed had a baby, your first question probably would have been, "Is it a boy or a girl?" And when you found out it was a boy, you would have thought his life expectancy was pretty short. Mm -hmm. But God preserved his life, but he had that, so he was the only. Hebrew man, his age, we don't know how long that went on, but there wasn't any other male Hebrew men mm. that were had birthdays anywhere close to, to Moses. And he was with his parents long enough that he was able to form a faith in God and a, 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 a Jewish worldview. And he was able to, he, he went in the language and the belief in, in God. And he, and then he goes to the palace. Now he's trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and he learns the Egyptian language and he's in the palace and he learns to know all the people in government and how the system works and how you get things done. And then he tries to rescue the Jewish people and then winds up in the wilderness. And now he's in his third culture and third language. And, and there he is being a shepherd. And I just think there were some days when Moses was out there tending sheep where he thinks, you know, I, I have no clue what my life is about. Like, this is crazy. I, I, like, none of these pieces, I mean, they're all intriguing pieces, but they don't make any sense put together. And then one day God shows up in the burning bush and says, hey, I've seen the affliction of the people. I've heard their cry and I've come down to deliver them. And Moses is like, great idea. I thought that should have been done 20 years ago and, <laughs> or 40 years ago. And, and um, so I'm glad you're here. And then God says, so I'm sending you. And suddenly the picture changes and, and Moses asks the question, who am I that I should go and deliver the people uh, out of Egypt? And you would think that God would turn to Moses and say, well, what do you think this is about? Like, you're the only Hebrew man your age. You know all the people in the palace. You know the royal family. You know how the government works. Uh, you have wilderness experience. Mm -hmm. Like, what else do you need? Who else would I ask? But it's kind of like God just sort of ignores all that and says, oh, yeah, well, I'll be with you. And so we have these foundations hmm. and God prepares us. And and at the events of our lives are not without purpose. Like God brings us on a journey with pieces that maybe we don't understand, but it's going somewhere mm -hmm. and there's a purpose to it. And so we look, sometimes we look at our spiritual foundations and we look at our our sovereign foundations, the things that... God chose for us and we're like, why? Like, mm -hmm. and we want to reject it and, and, or be frustrated by it. But, but God chose those things for us. And, mm -hmm. and, and so we, we, and during that time we can have bitterness over hurts and losses and, mm -hmm. and we can kind of have uh, maybe a, a lack of confidence or we can feel intimidated because of our family or our mm -hmm. church or whatever. And, or it could be arrogance and and pride and 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 those things can hinder mm -hmm. where where God wants to um, to take us. But then often there's an event that comes that is a moment where we realize what God is doing in the world and we want to be part of it. And we're like, I want to make a difference in the world. I I want to be involved in the kingdom of God. I want to see that kingdom grow and advance and there are just problems in the world that somebody needs to do something about and I can do something. And so I'm going to, I'm going to get involved and I'm, I'm going to do stuff for God. Um, but then we realize, but I'm not ready. Mm -hmm. I, I need knowledge. I need skills. There's things I have to, to develop. And at that point we move into the second stage of, um, mm -hmm. uh, where we're just developing our own mm -hmm. inner life and growth. Mm-hmm. So you've talked about the sovereign foundations. Those are the things that God chose for us. Right. So we get got that through that transit, um, 
through that section using Moses as an example. So you're saying stage two. What's what's your second stage then? Yeah, stage two is inner life growth, where we be, we begin to develop the knowledge base, the skills uh, that we mm. need in order to uh, follow the calling that God brings into our life. It might be academic mm. training. It might be apprenticeship. It, it might just be finding a mentor, a model, a role model that we look at and say, there's somebody who's doing something mm. that I'd like to do and how can I learn that? And, um, and so we may experiment with different things and say, well, I'd like to... Um, I'd like to teach English as a second language. I'd like to do medical work, I'd, um, whatever it is. And, and we, we begin to look at, okay, what do I need to learn and, and how do I get into that? And what's, what's the path for me to take that role in, um, in what God's doing? And then during this stage, God begins to mold our character through meaningful relationships with people. And we, we develop... Uh, relationships with people that can give us knowledge, give us wisdom. And then God also starts checking our character. And uh, you think about Joseph and Daniel, both men that God checked, like there was an integrity check there and, and, and they passed it. Like Joseph chose God over, over Potiphar's wife and his relationship with her. And, and he, he just said, I can't do this thing against God. And so God checked his, his, uh, his integrity, his character. And Daniel went to Babylon and, but chose to be true to who he was and, and ask for a different diet. And, and, and God gave him that, uh, that integrity check. So it's kind of checking, do we live by our convictions or do we, do we compromise and do we find a way of kind of justifying, well, you know, I'm in a different situation here and mm -hmm. I can, I need to do something different. Um, and so then there's also, um, God takes us through checks of, uh, of, um, obedience. Like, do we, do we follow God's voice? Like if he prompts us mm. to do something, will I do it? And, you know, there's those things where you just feel, um, God wants me to talk to that person. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, I don't even know them. Like, why would I talk to them? And, and, but then when, if we do, then we find out, oh, there was, mm -hmm. it leads to an encounter that God had designed for us and an opportunity that he gave us. And then if we are faithful and do that, then God gives us increasingly important opportunities because he knows if he prompts us to do something, we're actually going to do it. We're actually going to, we're actually going to act on it. And he checks our, our willingness to obey the, uh, the spirit. And, um, and then there's the whole matter of, of forgiveness. And you think about Joseph again and his brothers, like the way they treated him and, 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 but his ability to forgive them and say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And, and to be able to forgive the wrongs um, against us and also to recognize that I need people's forgiveness and, and I do things that are hurtful to other people. And I need to be willing to confess when I'm wrong and ask for forgiveness. And it becomes a, a two-way street because relationships don't work unless there's forgiveness, unless there's grace. And the closer the relationship, the more there's a need for forgiveness and, mm -hmm. and grace. And we kind of have a natural tendency to want mercy and forgiveness for ourselves, but justice for everybody else. So you think about it, if you're going down the highway and the speed limit's 55, and somebody passes you doing about 70 or 75, and two miles down the road, you see them pulled over with the lights flashing behind them, you're like, yes, nail that guy. Like he deserves it. And, but then if you're the person who's in a hurry and you're passing somebody doing 70 and you get pulled over, you're thinking, oh, please don't give me a ticket, just a mm. warning or nothing, you know? Mm. And, but in, in relationships, we need to be able to have grace and mercy and forgiveness go both mm. ways um, because we, we all need it. And then there's word checks where, mm. 
um, God checks to see if we read something in Scripture, are we going to do it or or not? Mm-hmm. And where are we obedient to what we read in in the Word? And then the there's ministry checks where coming in like we all kind of come into this stage of we want to do the big things like I, and and uh, mm-hmm. you know we're gonna I'm gonna be the next whoever and I'm just gonna you know I want to change the world and <laughs> I'm gonna do all these amazing things and and then somebody needs to mop the floor or somebody needs to change mm-hmm. the oil in the vehicle and 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 it's our willingness to do those little things, those things that seem insignificant but make the whole thing work. That mm. uh, God checks to see if if we're willing to do the the small stuff. And I remember mm. a staff person that came on staff um, with Northern Youth and and a young single man. And when he was coming, his dad told me, "There's one thing I want my son to learn. I want him to learn." that missionaries need to wash their car and cut their grass. And because mm. he was saying he has this image of missionaries doing all these amazing things, but but you guys have lives to live. And mm. and there's a lot of everyday, ordinary things that need to be done. And I think God checks if we're willing to, mm-hmm. to do those. And the challenges can be at this stage is just a lack of role models or a lack of... Mm-hmm. of uh, mentors and um, maybe an unwillingness to be a, a learner and mm-hmm. and then our character flaws be, start to become obvious and there's things that we need to to correct and, and lessons that we need to learn just mm-hmm. in forming our, our character. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about the sovereign foundations and then the inner life growth. So those two stages. So let's say we've gotten through that part. What's the next stage? What's stage three? Yeah, stage three is the ministry maturing. And uh, where a person gets into ministry, there's entry into ministry and um, uh, and maybe in, even into leadership. And you begin to to get engaged in in um, in leadership. And there's, there's leadership skills. There's leadership uh, training. And there's a discovery of gifts. What do I do well? And where what's my... What's my sweet spot as far as mm. as responsibilities, and where do I function? Where do I function the best? Um, and just that discovery of of uh, of leadership skills and abilities, and we begin to get involved in in leadership and influence with mm. with people, and and begin to build um, build skills. But then there's relational learning, just. Uh, understanding authority and mm-hmm. and and it's this whole thing of leadership and and the delicate balance of yeah there are decisions that need to be made and yet the leader is a servant so how does that all mm-hmm. how does that all work and and how do you step out and and say this is where we're headed this is what we're going to do and at the same time be a servant to the group and so learning about authority and learning about um, how to how to actually do leadership mm-hmm. and how to actually um, group dynamics and, and how that how does that work um, and there's different styles of leadership and a, a good leader is able to provide the style that's needed at the moment like there are moments when a leader just needs to say, "This is what we need to do," and this is this is. And there's moments where a leader needs to say, "What do you all think?" and mm-hmm. and can we uh, arrive at a at a consensus here? And um, and so we get insights on on relationships and how do the how does how do the leadership relationships work? Um, but along with that, then there's there's conflicts and dealing with mm-hmm. conflicts, dealing with when people don't agree and when there's different ideas and sometimes there's very strong feelings and a leader needs to be able to negotiate those conversations and help people to be able to talk to each other and be able to work toward a consensus mm-hmm. and toward arriving at a at a decision. Um, and, and that's challenging to 
to deal with with conflicts mm-hmm. and sometimes those conflicts are actually uh, the animosity is directed toward the leader <laughs> and it's yeah. like the backlash of well you did this and mm-hmm. and um, and that was hurtful and and the challenging thing is that sometimes there are decisions that need to be made and because of all the dynamics of the decision it's not appropriate to tell everybody all the mm. all the things that are going into making the decision because some of it is confidential so you're making a decision that affects everybody but everybody doesn't have all the information they don't know what you know as a mm-hmm. leader and sometimes you're even in a situation where a decision has to be made and it's going to be good for some people and not good for other people mm-hmm. and you don't have a choice that's going to be good for everybody you don't have a choice that where everybody's going to be happy mm-hmm. and those are really hard mm-hmm. decisions to make um but and so sometimes at this point leaders people who are in leadership will drop out and mm-hmm. say i'm done uh mm-hmm. it's too difficult uh I can't handle the the backlash. Or I don't like. I can't deal with the conflicts, and somebody else can do this. I, mm. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it. Um, and they drop out because of of the conflicts or the backlash against their their leadership. Mm. Um, so, and maybe that's a common misunderstanding with leadership, where it's not. Like a drill sergeant, I'm going to tell you what to do and you just need to do it because I'm the leader. Right. Leadership is so relational. And those relationships can, as you're saying, it's very stress. It can be very stressful. Right. Depending, like humans are complicated and getting a team to all work together, there's all kinds of different dynamics. And yeah, it's stressful. Um, so anyways, continuing on there though with, with so we're still in stage three, yeah. the um, uh, maturing into ministry. Um yeah. Is there more there on on that? Yeah. Basically what God's doing at that stage is he's uh, taking us from doing leadership to actually being a leader mm-hmm. and where we're like, we develop leadership skills and we're, we're working at, at leadership skills, but then there actually comes a point where we're recognized as you're a leader, like people, mm-hmm. people follow you and you have influence and it comes from those things of character and competence that have been displayed and you start to build a track record, you start to build a history and, and you actually move to being, um, a leader and moving toward maturity Mm -hmm. in, um, in leadership. One of the dangers is at this stage is that you can plateau and you kind of can function as a leader and you just sort of, uh, you don't go on to develop greater leadership skills, uh, you just kind of, you can do it. And it's just, you sort of flatline and just kind of go on without mm-hmm. uh, moving to a, a, a greater level. And uh, when we plateau spiritually and we don't uh, increase our ability to draw from God's resources or level of maturity, mm-hmm. then you have that whole Peter principle where people get promoted to their level of incompetence and, and that can happen to where you're functioning good at this level and then you get promoted. But if you don't mm-hmm. increase your maturity and your ability to draw resources from God and and develop more skills, that's then it leads to, to like burnout and overload and, and, and then you're ineffective at that level. And so we want to keep growing and keep learning and keep drawing from God's resources in deeper ways so that mm. we get to new levels of, of, uh, of leadership and, and effectiveness. And so we can, we can, uh, limit ourselves by, by not growing mm-hmm. and, and also at this stage, some people make mistakes that disqualify them and they, mm-hmm. they get disqualified from, mm-hmm. from leadership as well. And so you can, you can uh, drop out because of conflicts, you can be disqualified because of mistakes, or you can plateau 
but the alternative is to keep growing and keep mm -hmm. maturing and working toward greater levels of influence and effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, I can see that that's one of the things with leadership. It, it could be pretty easy to be like, okay, we've arrived here, we're good, we're just kind of plateau and settle for wherever we're, you know, this, in, in, we're at stage three, so settle right there, this is good enough. Um, and you're saying, you know, we have to be careful with that and continually be calling ourselves to hire. Um, what does that look like? That continued growth. So stay, what's stage four then at that point? Well, stage four is where you have had the character development and development of competence to the point where people recognize this is a person who has, who is a leader, who, who is worth following and the, the, the level of influence really grows and there's um, you know, someone said, well, you know, how do you be an effective, uh, how do you keep from making mistakes? Well, you learn from experience. Well, how do you get to experience, how do you get experience? Well, you make mistakes. And so you get to the point where you've made oh. enough of mistakes <laughs> that people realize, oh, here's a person who has experience. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. I think you're, you're, I think you're not wrong on that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then when you get there to that level, then you have a, a sphere of influence that has increased because of character and because of competence and mm. just just the experience that you've had and the number of things that you've done. Like in Servant Institute, as I'm 70 years old, and and uh, um, so a lot of the men in Servant Institute are in their 30s, 40s, and you know, sometimes they'll say, like, what do you do when this happens? I'm like, oh, yeah, that does happen. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> and, you know, I can, at my age, I can tend to forget hmm. some of the experience that I've had, some of the things that have happened mm -hmm. over the decades of leadership. But then talking to younger leaders, it's like, oh, yeah, that, mm -hmm. I do remember that happens. And, and so there's that experience then allows us to well you just learn how to how to deal with with things um mm -hmm. and you know we shouldn't be surprised when there are challenges and and conflicts um mm -hmm. and i was um there was a bible camp that asked me to they were having some conflicts with their staff and they asked me to come and help them to work through some of their staff conflicts and um the director there was saying, oh, he just doesn't know why people don't get along and why things don't work. And and I was telling him, you know, you have to realize in leadership that if everybody got up every morning and knew what to do and how to do it, and they all got along with each other, you, you wouldn't have a job as a leader. There wouldn't be anything for you to do. So your staff conflicts and the need for leadership mm. in your organization is your job security. So, so, <laughs> so don't resent it. It's why you're there. Wow. Yeah. And uh, okay. I know when I was when <laughs> That's I was a just, different way of looking at it. When <laughs> I was just getting started in leadership, uh, there was a a man that was older than I was that was that I, I was responsible to, and mm. I think I was kind of complaining about some staff conflicts or something. Mm -hmm. I was complaining about something that, a problem that I was facing. And and he told me, Merle, if you're going to be successful in leadership, you need to learn to eat problems for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner, and enjoy it every day. Because if you don't, you're not going to make it. Uh, mm -hmm. If you resent problems, you're just not going to survive in leadership. And there's some truth to that. It's it's just part of, it comes with the territory. But when we move into mature leadership, we're able to say, okay, this is why I'm here. Um, mm -hmm. We'll work through this stuff. And and we, we, we enjoy seeing people grow and seeing people be led to, to maturity. And so I've had men that I worked with that taught me about, well, the man who told me about eating problems for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I, from him, I learned about maturity and how a mature person responds to disappointments and to conflicts. Mm -hmm. I had another person that re, I learned a lot about faith and how to trust God. And 
and that I don't have to make everything happen. I can rest and just see what God does. And, mm -hmm. and there, so there's just people that God brings into our lives that helps us to develop some of the character qualities that we need in order to be mm -hmm. effective in, um, in leadership. Part of the problems we can have in the mature leadership stage is just, um, the isolation that mm -hmm. comes with, with leadership and, and we need to seek out other leaders that we can, we can talk to and, and dialogue with and get some encouragement from and, and, um, um, and also you can just get weary of, of the conflict and, uh, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons why I think for men my age, it's good to, for us to move into roles of, uh, being coaches and advisors rather than carrying the responsibility because there are things mm -hmm. that if they would have happened when I was 35 by 40, I would have said, okay, yeah, we'll fix this. This is, mm -hmm. you know, well, great. We'll jump in and we can fix this. But at 65 or between 65 and 70, if some of those things happened, I'd be like, oh, not again. You know, do, mm. like, why can't people just do what they need to do and, and get along with each other. And mm -hmm. so there's a, a lack of energy and, and just a kind of a weariness that can set in. And I think that, um, to just endure and to be able to, mm -hmm. uh, when we're in that stage to, to do the things that, that need to be, be done. And then there can be crises that really big things that come along that, mm -hmm. um, take a lot of energy, a lot of time and that are out of the ordinary and um and there can be failures things that that just don't work and mm -hmm. um and being able to deal with those is um is important but this is a really great stage because it, it's one of the times in life where we have the most impact and the most influence mm -hmm. because we pro were proven to be a, to have good character and to be competent and we can really get a, a lot of things accomplished um, in in this stage. Mm -hmm. So that's stage four, the yeah. life maturing mm -hmm. stage. So what comes after that? Like that seems like we're we're getting ourselves to uh, to a level that's, um, yeah, not not entirely normal. Like this would be beyond just average uh, leadership, perhaps, or I, I'm not even sure the right terminology to use, but I think you know what I'm getting at. But what comes after that? Well, for some people, it can move into a fifth stage, which is convergence, where uh, your experience and your passions and your natural skills all kind of converge. And you are recognized as you are a person that, like you have skills in these areas and you mm. get to do the things that you're really good at doing. Like in every job, in every leadership role, there are things you're good at and things you're not good at. There are things you enjoy doing and things you don't enjoy doing. But for some people, you get to a stage where people recognize your giftings to a point where they mm. relieve you of all the things you're not good at. <laughs> And all the things you don't like to do, and you get to just do the things you enjoy doing. Oh, uh, it's is it kind of this is almost like, um, yeah, the convergence of skills, passion, the things that that bring you joy, or yeah. the things that you know, you're good at or, right. or rejuvenating. It's those things coming together. Am I right, am I yeah. tracking correctly? Yeah. Okay, I like, can see what you mean that not everybody gets to that place. Yeah, it seems like, like that would be hard. Yeah. Like for me, I'm I'm much stronger on the relational side of leadership than I am on the paperwork side. Mm. But there's a lot of administrative paperwork that needs to be done to be in a leadership role. Mm. But I did administration and I tolerated the paperwork and tried to be good, good enough at the paperwork to get a passing grade because it gave me relationships with people and mm. I could, I could shepherd people and I could help them to develop and, and I just got my joy out of seeing people grow and seeing people be, become more enthused about Christ and about what the mm. kingdom of God is doing and, and, and to build skills and abilities. And, but I had to do the, the whole paperwork side of administration and all the planning and all, <laughs> all mm. that stuff. But in some, sometimes it, it would almost drive me crazy, but 
then I got to do the relational side of it. But now I'm retired from administration, and so I just get to do relationships, right? I just get I get to do Servant Institute. I get to mm-hmm. do mentoring at Servant. I don't have to do any paperwork. I don't have to do any planning. Like they do all the planning. I just show up and mm-hmm. and I get assigned people, and I I I relate. And and so it's it's uh, it's just that time of life where you really get to enjoy the things you're good at and that you really enjoy mm-hmm. in, and you're freed of all the all the things that uh, you're not good. And I suppose there's people that just really enjoy the paperwork and planning side of it that go down that route and they get to help organizations with planning and strategy and and how you do all the reporting and all those things and mm-hmm. and and they really thrive in that. So um but the, yeah, the convergence stage is just where you get to do the things you really like to do and are good at. And then probably to get to something like that requires a lot of long-term faithfulness. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's really good. Um, as a rule, we don't talk about leadership as much as maybe we should, uh, defining it and trying to grow and develop ourselves in that area. Yeah. So I'm I'm really glad you're... You, for what you're doing with your part in helping to mentor the next group of leaders coming along. And um, as we tie up this very big topic, which we've only barely started on because there's just so much to this this thing of leadership, what are some things you'd say in conclusion? What's some some principles that people can uh, take from this episode? Yeah. Well, the challenge is to stay engaged through all the stages and to let God train us and develop us. And Mm. some parts of it are really painful and some parts of it are really challenging and really difficult. And so there are people who drop out. There are people who plateau, but hanging in there to the end, there's a lot of dropouts and there's a lot of plateaued leaders. Probably the majority of leaders are people that got to a certain stage Mm. and they just plateau and there's some that are focused and disciplined, but there's a few that really finish well and mm. and really are able to to have an impact for more than their own their own generation. And mm. I just encourage us to think about how we can bless the next generation that follows us and and that is like as like I have more history behind me than I have future ahead of me. But there are men and women coming into the flow of history and God's story of humanity that have a lot more future ahead of them than history behind them. And just as I walk off the stage of of life to be able to point some direction to those coming on. Mm. And I think that this is a really, I just think we're at a really exciting point in history like God is doing amazing things in our world. And your generation has has more resources than any other generation in our circles has ever had. And mm-hmm. the technology that you have, the ability to communicate is, is amazing. And travel, mm-hmm. the ability to travel is amazing. Like where I live, if my grandfather a hundred years ago would have wanted to go from Ephrata, Pennsylvania to where I live, it would have taken him three months to get there. Mm-hmm. And I can leave my house in Sulaco at 7.30 in the morning and be in Philadelphia at four o'clock in the afternoon. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's amazing. And we can be almost anywhere in the world in 24 to 48 hours. And, um, and then when we get there, we can get on some, uh, social media app and video our mom and tell her we're here and show her where we're sleeping and she relaxes and and there's probably more wealth going to be transferred from one generation to another as the baby boomers die in the next 20 years than ever before in our circles and Mm -hmm. so i i i'm kind of jealous of the next generation. I, I really think it's a great time to be alive. And mm. God is, I think God's going to do some amazing things in the next 50 years. And the people who are a generation younger than me are going to get to watch what God does and, mm. and be part of it. And it's going to take people who step forward to be leaders. Mm. 
to make those to help to make those things happen. Mm-hmm. Using well the gifts and opportunities that we've been given, yeah. and maybe not settling for a lesser level, but continuing to to grow, develop ourselves, and help the people around us. Essentially, isn't isn't that what it's ultimately about with leadership? You you were using terms like service and serving others. It's not about us. It's right. about how can we serve people better? And that's true leadership. It is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Thank yeah. you so much for coming on today and, and sharing this with us. This is, a, this is a lot to think about. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode with Merle Burkholder. In addition to these regular episodes that we release, we also publish regular essays over on our website and in audio form. You can find that at anabaptistperspectives.org. We also publish a regular email newsletter, which you can freely sign up for on our website. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Thank you.